I slept like the dead last night. It was, it was one of those sleeps where you wake up and you're like, yeah. Oh, it was good. It was really good. Ah, feels good to be alive today. For me, I don't know how you're doing. But um, we're in week three of our four-week study of the book of the prophet Haggai. Yes, I know it's trendy. I know everyone's doing it. You know, we've bowed to the pressure. By popular demand, we're doing Haggai. You're welcome. Um, and if you remember, just to start with some context for today, because this is like, it's important to know where we've come from in, for today to make sense. This book is from a period where God's chosen people, Israel, have been in captivity in Babylon for many decades. But God finally works to allow them to return to Jerusalem and start rebuilding it. And this is a great object lesson straight off, because at first everyone's super excited to get back. You know, this is great. We're free. We're free. This is so great. God's so great. But then a little time passes, and they start falling right back into their old patterns. Thank goodness that never happens anymore. Um, no, they lose focus. They lose their priorities and stop working on God's stuff and focusing on their own stuff, their own priorities. And so God sends a messenger. He sends Haggai to poke them. Hey, hey, remember why you're here. Remember what you're supposed to be doing, like why you were set free. You need to check your priorities. Consider your heart, God tells them. And he tells them you need to start building. So that was Haggai's first message. We saw it two weeks ago. Get started. And then about a month after the work starts, God sends a second message through Haggai. And this is a message of encouragement. God says, I am with you. Be encouraged. Don't worry about whether what you're building looks good from the outside. I mean, they're trying to build the temple with like rubble. You know, it's not looking great. But he says, don't worry if it looks impressive. You're not building for my presence. You're not building for my grace. You're building from them. So be encouraged. Your report card isn't whatever it looks like when it's done. It's your heart in the work, working faithfully on mission with me. Oh, and by the way, just to give you a promise, eventually, God says, the temple is going to be even more glorious than the first one that Solomon built, all and that got destroyed all those years ago. So that's the story up till now. That's our recap. God gives a message of direction and then a message of encouragement. And today, we see a third word from God to the people. And this is a message of instruction. Instruction. And this is actually, as I was reading through Haggai and looking at it, this is a pattern I've seen a lot in my own life. Okay? Maybe it's just me, but maybe it's you too. God starts by saying, here's something I need you to do. Or for me more frequently, here's something I need you to not do. Knock that off. Whatever the direction is. And when I'm obedient to God's voice in my life, usually next, I receive a message of encouragement. You're going the right way. Keep going. I'm with you. And then after that, very often God has given me instruction, more instruction. And I appreciate that because I know a lot of you are of the generation where you remember like when you were a kid and you were on a really long car ride and maybe you had a book with you that you're reading, but then the sun starts to go down and there's a lot of ride left. Like, oh, it got dark. And you're left going, well, I guess... Guess I'll just sit here. You know, this is before smartphones. <laughs> I remember those times. There were three of us kids. We had one Game Boy. And batteries did not last long. So you're just sitting there. It's like, I'm going somewhere. Like, I'm in motion. I'm making progress towards a destination. But I'm kind of on hold till I get there. You know? Until we arrive, there's nothing for me to do. That's not how God operates. God gives us stuff to do. Yes, this line in Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So there's stuff to do. But the process of doing the stuff is not just about that stuff being accomplished at the end of the process. Does that make sense? God's like, I want you to work, right? Like in this example, I want you to rebuild the temple. But... The reason I've asked you to do this is not so that a temple exists. That's, that's not why. That's missing the point. We're not on hold until the work is done. The work is part of the point. God says, I have something to teach you. 
not just at the end, not just at the destination, but also through the process. He says, I have a deeper purpose at work here. And so with that in mind, let me give you just a few bullets we're going to make our way through today, and then we're going to jump right into the text. Today's sermon I'm calling Purpose Made, and we're going to cover the purpose of the law and the purpose of the work and the purpose of the Christ. We're going to get into it today. There's going to be like theology. Yeah, one person's excited. And it's the pastor. Right. So, <laughs> so please open your Bible, your app with me, text on screen, probably too small for any human to read. Um, Haggai 2, verses 10 through 19, goes like this. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, gross, and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priests answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priests answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward. Before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. Let's pray as we get started. Thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Oh, thank you for your word. That there is truth that we can turn to and lean on and just dive into the depths of your truth. Your word is forever. And this word is just as much for us as it was for those people here in Haggai. Because you are eternal. You were and you are and you will be. And your truth is forever and ever. So please make your truth come alive in our hearts today. Make this word resonate in our hearts today. Convict us and teach us and encourage us and draw us to you. Get our eyes on you. And I ask that I not be in the way, that I not hinder or be an obstacle to anybody hearing from you clearly today. Get me out of the way and let your word speak. Thank you for this opportunity to gather and just to build each other up and be built up by you to the glory and praise of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray these things. And everybody said, amen. amen. Right. So all that is interesting. God asks his people a series of questions, questions mostly about the law. This is the original law that God gave to his people through Moses, long before Israel was carried off into captivity in Babylon. God gave his people a list of laws, and he tells them, follow these. And they're laws about conduct and about holiness, right? It's basically, here's what you need to do if you are going to be in relationship with a holy God. God's like, I'm not in direct relationship with any other nation on earth. I've chosen you. And not even because you're great or there's anything awesome about you. I chose you by grace because I am good. And I choose to be good to you and to do good through you. Through you, I'm going to bless the whole world. 
But I do have some expectations as part of this covenant. So here are the requirements of holiness that I have for you. And so there's all these laws about holiness and unholiness. The law refers to it as, as cleanness and uncleanness. Sort of these two spiritual states that we can have, and they can't overlap. It's not like a dimmer switch. It's like a, a light switch, right? You're either all of one or you're all of the other. So if you touch a dead body, you become unclean for a period of time. If you have certain diseases, if you eat certain prohibited foods, these things can make you unclean. And God, through Haggai, asks the priests of Israel, these are the experts on cleanness and uncleanness, he asks them two legal questions. God asks, if someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with this fold bread or stew or wine or oil of any kind of food, does it become holy? Right? Like, if you pick up some holy meat from the altar and you dip it in stew, does it become holy stew? And the priests say, no. Then Haggai said, okay, let's say you accidentally touch a dead body. It happens. And then you touch the stew. Does it become unclean stew? And they say, yes. So what's this about? Why is God asking these questions? And this is our first point today, the purpose of the law. And I want to say, <clears throat> these are not trick questions. These are not even particularly difficult questions. This is like, are you smarter than a fifth grader priest? The priests know the answer to both of these. This is easy stuff. So what's this about? What's this about? This is about holiness and unholiness and God and people. God is trying to teach Israel something through the process of the work that he's appointed for them to do. God's like, this work is not just about the work. I'm going to learn you something. I'm going to try to open your mind to something profound. So the first question, basically, if you have something that's considered holy, right, and you use it to touch something else, does that become holy? And the law says, no, it doesn't. Holiness is not communicable like that. It doesn't transfer. But the second question, he says, if you're unclean and you touch the same something else, does it become unclean? Yes, it does. The uncleanness transfers. If I'm unclean, according to the law, and I touch you, you become unclean. It's like cooties, essentially. right? So this, this is a refresher course on the basics. And God is pointing something out. He's pointing out that because of the curse, because of our fall back in Genesis 3, and the way that our nature and our relationships have been infected with sin, we don't transfer holiness. We don't. We only transfer unholiness. And God says, I want you to think about that while you're building this temple. Because God says, so it is. With this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. God says, I told you to work. And then I encouraged you. And I told you I'm with you. But now I also want to teach you something. This temple you're building is not sanctified by anything you do. It can't be. Remember, because of what I established with you all those years ago, whether it's people or a city or a nation, you can't create holiness and you can't transfer it, which means that this temple you're building for me with your hands is unclean. And on the surface, this sounds discouraging, doesn't it? It sounds like a discouragement. But what if we reframe our experience of this? Because we can hear information in different ways. Our preconceptions and our emotions really lead how we hear something, right? Because if you like somebody, you'll hear what they say with a favorable ear. You'll instinctively kind of assign them good motives and assume the best intentions. And if you dislike someone, they can tell you the exact same thing and you'll receive it unfavorably. This is true of politics. It's true of relationships. And it's true of God's word. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon, he said this, the same sun which melts wax hardens clay. 
And he said, in the same gospel, which melts some persons to repentance, hardens others in their sin. It depends on how we hear it, how we're approaching it. This is why the Bible speaks truth to some people, but it's foolishness to others. It's about the posture of my heart as I approach it. So if I hear what God is saying with a humble heart, with a teachable heart, then what's he really saying here? Because we've seen this three-phase pattern, right? God said, one, build the temple, prioritize around me. Then two, be encouraged, I'm with you. And now three, don't just work, learn. Learn about holiness and the direction that it flows. God, with his work he's appointed for them to do, is not just trying to have them do a construction project. The work isn't ultimately the point. The point is God being with his people. That's what the temple represents. God dwelling with us. So what's happening is God is trying to build them up spiritually as they build physically. And he's pointing them forward to the coming of the Messiah. Paul says this about the law in Galatians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18 and verse 24, talking about how the law came long after God's original promise to bless the world and send a savior, right? First was the promise and then was the law. And Paul says this, what I'm saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance, that is to say restoration of our relationship with God, is based on law, it's no longer based on the promise. But God has granted it to Abraham all those years ago by means of promise. Therefore, the law has become our tutor. That's how the New American Standard Bible says it. There's lots of good translations out there. Normally we quote ESV, but I just like this one. It says the law has become our tutor. ESV will say the law was like our guardian. You know? I like that too. But it's our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. And he goes on to talk about, like, that's the whole point. That Abraham was just, he believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He was justified by faith. And so the law comes not to overwrite the covenant. The law comes as a means to instruct us and to point us forward to Christ. God is reminding Israel that they and that we are justified by faith, not by our actions, not by what we can accomplish and build, because we're all under sin. We're only capable of transmitting uncleanness because of our broken nature. That's the original point we're coming from. That's our origin. The sin. This is the essence of why we're unable to save ourselves. Why we need a savior. We need someone who comes from a different origin point to bring holiness, to transmit holiness to us and to the world. And here we get to our second point, the purpose of the work. Because this whole section of history where God is having Israel rebuild the temple is really supposed to point to the coming of Jesus. This is all about grace. Makes me thirsty. <laughs> because see what God says here. He asks two more questions. He says this, Before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, the thing you're building, how did you fare? Answer, not so good. When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. It's like, oh man, my heap. <laughs> when one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you. And all the products of your toil with blight and mildew and hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. And then he says, this is a really interesting bit, consider from this day onward, from today, the 24th day of the ninth month, since that day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid and you started working, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Answer, no. He says, indeed. He answers his own question again. The vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. That's interesting. God says, I have been trying to get your attention. I've been trying to tune you in to the truth that the things of this world, that which you build and you grow and you accomplish and you achieve, they will never satisfy you. They come from an origin point of sin and brokenness, and so they cannot 
satisfied, the deep hunger that we have in our soul for the things of God, eternal things, that which we lost when sin entered the world and we were separated from God. So that's half of it. But the other half, God says, is that I don't want you to turn to me just because there's a reward in it for you. God says, since you started building, I haven't just flipped all the switches and made everything instantly great. Like God's not a pinata that we whack with prayer and obedience till blessings come out. Like he's not a math equation. Worship in, blessing out. If we're coming to God just because we think we'll get something, we haven't understood what we've already gotten. We haven't understood it. We've missed it. We've missed what God has already done for us because we haven't properly prioritized the cross. There is no greater blessing. There is no greater gift. God gave us his only son. Jesus came to us to be the temple, the presence of God dwelling with us. And the religious people missed it, just like we can miss it. They missed it. Why? Because they didn't learn the lesson of Haggai. Through Haggai, God says, yes, build. Yes, I'm with you. Yes, the temple in the future will be more glorious than the first one. But don't forget, it's not glorious because you built something beautiful or amazing. The glory comes from me. And that supersedes any other yardstick of judgment. Because here's the thing, eventually this temple that they're building in Haggai, this is going to get a major upgrade, okay? Like the extremist of home makeovers. The temple is going to become a wonder of the ancient world. Like people from other nations are going to come and see it, and like historians wrote on how incredible it was. But here's the thing, who builds it? Who built that new temple? Herod. Herod, the paranoid dictator. Herod the mass murderer. Herod builds that temple. That's who does the glow up. And the religious leaders are like, yeah, I mean, I know he's a bad guy, but look at the temple. It's so glorious, just like Haggai said it would be. And they're captivated by the externals and how impressive it looks, but they don't realize there's no glory because God's not there. God is outside the city dying on a cross for the sins of the world because of grace. Not because we did anything amazing, anything to deserve it, but because he is good, because he chooses to bless his enemies and pursue them with love. That's how God ends this message from Haggai. But from this day on, I will bless you. That's the purpose of the Christ. In closing today, I want this text to encourage you. I know I said in closing. We got like 10 minutes left. Buckle up. But <laughs> First, I want to encourage you to tune in to what God is trying to teach you in your life. Right? Through whatever part of the work or the journey or the process that you're in. It's never wasted time. God doesn't waste time. He uses time. God is wanting to teach you something. You know, maybe God wants to tell you, get building. Huh? Just, just start. Just swing a hammer. Gordon told me this amazing line. He said, it's a lot easier to steer a car when it's moving. Just get, get working. Get building. Do something. Or maybe he's trying to tell you, I'm with you. Like he's not just a cold, distant judge. He says, I love you so dearly, and I'm with you, and I want to give you encouragement. Maybe that's what he's trying to tell you. Or maybe it's what we see today, and he's trying to give you instruction. See, God just, he doesn't want us to just be obedient little robots. He doesn't want us to be unquestioning, mindless drones. God wants us to grow. He gave us minds so we could worship him with our minds. And he wants to grow in our minds, our understanding of his glory our understanding of the gospel, to grow in our understanding of us and God and our relationship 
and how much he loves us and what that love cost him, the riches of his grace. And he's given us his word. He's given us the church, Sunday meetings, midweek Bible study, just coffee with a sister or brother, wrestling through it. This is how Paul says it, Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. And he, God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood or womanhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So that's my first encouragement for you. Be looking for the lesson. I promise there is one. Look for the lesson. Whatever this chapter is in your life. Is your life hard right now? God's trying to teach you something. Is your life in a good season? God's trying to teach you something. For me, all of last year, and I didn't realize this till the end. Like you don't always know what the lesson is while you're learning it. All of last year for me, God was teaching me about sacrifice. And not just like the book definition, the heart definition. That's what God was teaching me through a lot of lessons. And here's the thing. I don't want that to sound harsh or tragic because it wasn't. Like my relationship with God is richer for that instruction. It's one of the things I learned, the glory of Christ's sacrifice for me and the way that I'm empowered to just let go of things by being satisfied in him. So what's God trying to teach you right now? And let me tell you, if you don't know the answer to that question, I got good news. You can ask him. <laughs> That's good news. You can come to God. Lord, what am I supposed to be learning right now? I don't understand this one but I want to. How are you trying to grow me? Spend time with God in the word, in prayer, with fellow believers who can give you another perspective. What are you trying to teach me? How can I grow in Christ in the middle of what I'm in the middle of? And let me just say this. If there's things in your life that are constantly frustrating you, that are challenging and unsatisfying, it could be. It could be. God's just trying to get your attention. Hey, be about my stuff. So we saw in today's text. Maybe he's just trying to draw your focus back to him so he can reorient your vision and get you back into this process of momentum and growth. So that's the first thing. And this really leads to the second thing. This is to do with our perception. Okay? If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, awesome. But I want to encourage you, approach God as a friend. Approach God as a friend. Jesus says something amazing in John 15, 15. He says, no longer do I call you servants, he says to his followers. For the servant does not know what his master is doing. Servant's not receiving instruction, just direction. But Jesus says, I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. I said before, our perceptions can really dictate how we perceive and how we experience things because we can hear information in different ways. So I want to encourage you to hear God with a favorable ear. Hear God as a friend, a loving Father. Like when God tells me to knock something off, it's not because he's the fun police. It's like, oh, I don't want anyone to enjoy that. It's because he loves me, and he knows what's good for my soul, better than I do. When God allows something difficult to happen in my life, I need to hear it and experience it looking for his love. You know, because otherwise, we can get so self-righteous. 
God, what gives? I did everything right. I went to church, I read the Bible, I believed in Jesus, and my life didn't get any easier. Little Shirley Temple stomp, you know. And God's like, what does easier have to do with anything? Like, is that why you did those things? So your life would get easier? You're setting your sights too small. Our goal shouldn't be for our life to get easier. Because here's the thing, easier is easy. Because easier can come from anywhere. I can do easier, right? Like, I can make my life easier. Our goal should be for what Paul says, for our life to get holier. Holier is hard, because holier only comes from one place, and it's not me. There's only one source for that, which is what we saw in our text today. Holiness flows from God. Whatever God touches, he blesses. When Jesus touches a corpse, Jesus doesn't become unclean. The corpse becomes clean. His righteousness is so complete that death is driven out by the source of all life flowing in through his touch. And Jesus wants to touch my life. And Jesus wants to touch your life. God says, I chose you by grace, and I am good. That's why. And I choose to be good to you and do good through you. And a lot of the time, that good is not going to be easy. There's a saying in tree pruning. We've got this pear tree in our yard. When we moved in, it was completely overgrown. So we had to cut it back. And in pruning, they say, Growth follows the knife. Wherever you want a tree to grow, trim it there. And if it's planted in good soil, growth will follow. God wants us to be planted in Christ and to grow in Christ, to labor for Christ and to learn about Christ and to be directed by Christ and encouraged by Christ and instructed up in Christ. There's a theme. You know, we have a choice to make between the temple of Herod and the temple of Jesus. We all have that choice every day between working for ourselves and our glory and the things that are externally showy and impressive, but our lives filled with unsatisfying things and only transmitting uncleanness or working for God and his purpose with humility and a teachable heart and an eye looking for his glory and letting Jesus' touch make us clean. And then, and this is the really amazing part, Jesus works through us. We become the hands of Christ to others. We transmit his holiness through the work that he has prepared for us to do. That's the purpose for which we've been made. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works for cleanness, for holiness, which God prepared beforehand. He's already, he's already done the work, the real work, the work of the cross. He's done it, that we should walk in them. We don't do it for a blessing. We do it because we've already been blessed. Please pray with me.